not perfect. Good morning, everybody. <coughs> I'm very happy to announce that, as requested by our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Geshe Ngawasamten La, Professor Dr. Herbert has consented to deliver a talk on the subject of physics, quantum physics, and conventional reality. Dr. Herbert J. Benson is Professor of Physics at Hampshire College since 1971, a committed and transformative teacher of undergraduates. He has been a consultant <coughs> on science policy to the World Bank, AAAS, and the US President's Science Advisor. He served as visiting scientist at MIT from 1984 through 2004. In 1986, Herbert took the lead of an international team of research physicists, including Gany Greenberger, Michael Horn, and Anton Zillinger. In 20 years of NSF-funded research, the team produced a number of firsts in quantum teleportation, competition, and communication, and in the philosophical implications of modern science. He studied physics at Columbia, UC, Dan, UC San Diego, and Institute for Advanced Study, Princeton. His research interests include science and society, the effects of modern knowledge, quantum information, and quantum teleportation, and theoretical physics. How was a Kenlock National Leadership Fellow and recipient of the 1984 Sigma Z Proctor Prize with Victor Wissop. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society. The society seated his pioneering work at the start of two fields of quantum physics and his unique contribution to the understanding of sciences. He helped found and now heads a renowned Institute for Science. The Institute promotes and supports inclusive of moral and ethical values into science. Herb is the author and co-author of scores of scientific papers and two books, New Ways of Knowing and Muddling Through. Penstrand theory of super dense teleportation is currently being developed by US NASA for quantum communication for, from space to Earth. Herb practices Tibetan Buddhist meditation in the Dzogchen tradition. Now I would like to <coughs> request Professor Dr. Herbert to initiate his talk. Yes, is this on? Can you hear me? Good. Uh, so the, the talk is um, a little bit different than I usually give because uh, I start from ordinary physics and then move to quantum physics. So in order to really adapt my talk, how many people have studied science? Yes, how many people have had science camp, science courses, science uh, curriculum? Okay, keep your hands up. <laughs> I have uh, participated, uh, Professor Parthav Ghosh, uh, you know, science. They may raise your hands. Yes, and how many of you have actually studied mathematics up to, I don't know, algebra? Not so rare, look, not so rare. Okay, very good. And uh, now a more detailed question. How many people have experience of the kinds that uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Samten says with chemistry? <laughs> Okay. We chemistry students are today uh, taking their examination. Oh, okay. So no chemistry. How about physics? Any physics? physics One, two, three. Also, also taking their yeah, final. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, I ask that so that I can make my talk for you, and so you will be. You know, I won't. I won't say things that I uh, think you don't know. And I ask you to raise your hand and stop me. It's very unusual, but I will take questions in the middle. OK. My talk today, uh, physics, quantum physics, and conventional reality. But to give such a restricted talk, you need a subtitle, because 
this sort of says it's the wrong answer, the right answer is cognizant emptiness suffused with compassion. Brilliant knowing, completely empty and completely compassionate. Buddha mind. Oh, of course, I'm not an expert in that. I am an expert in the quantum mechanics, but I have some experience experience that really can't be called experience, a kind of recognition, initial, very elementary, not a very uh, philosophical or advanced knowledge of Buddhist. Okay. So I take uh, the moral of a good teacher to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then to tell you it and then to tell you that I've told it. So this is the main points of everything I will say. Physics was invented by Western philosophers in order to determine what reality was. They found that by making it mathematical, it can predict everything given understanding of causes and conditions. So far, very parallel. Quantum physics discovered that we can tell the causes, but the conditions can never be known. Exactly what we were supposed to know for conditions can't be known at the same time. Um, ultimately, the 20th century quantum physics, which is my specialty, disproved the elements of reality that were supposed to be that kind of outside reality um, established from its own side. I'm probably using the terms not quite correctly, but you understand what I'm saying. An external reality independent of the observer is actually disproven, and I'll talk about it, and I can explain in great detail exactly how that was done. Um, what instead was discovered is that the properties of the particles, the atoms, the things out of which everything is made arise only when we seek to make them arise. In particular, the mathematics that we apply is to measurements, and we as physicists measure things. When we measure it, it becomes real. Um, particles turn out to be empty of all properties on their own, requiring the creation of an observer who creates the, mutually creates the observed. Now there's something that most physicists don't tell you. When we study physics, maybe even when I teach it, you get to quantum mechanics and the moral, the, uh, the motto under which you're taught to actually use quantum mechanics is it works. Don't worry about all these things that you may have heard about waves and particles and contradictions and uncertainty. The theory works and it works amazingly well. Uh, the most accurate things that are measured are actually times. The time can be measured to one part in a lock of locks that's a a very high precision, not one part in a hundred, not one part in a crore, but one part in a lock of locks, maybe even a crore of crore for some quantities. So very, very accurate. So it really works, but when you hear the phrase, it works for something that's supposed to be a fundamental theory that everything else is supposed to be built out of, you should ask, what does it work to do? Whom does it work for? How does it work? And these are questions that make you ask, what is science, Western science, about? What is its goals? What is it left out? What should be included? For me, the question is a moral question. And uh, as we'll see as I get there, I hope, it may be at the stage of my very uh, low development, but nevertheless my interest, uh, an opening to Dzogchen values. 
I founded an institute, the introduction mentioned, based on values that were for progressive social purposes. But there may be a second form of values that come much closer to the Buddhist values, where if I can figure out how, if you can help me, if my friends in the science community can get this advance, maybe to think about the trikaya, probably not pronouncing it right, the dharmakaya, which is the actual existence of things when they don't have properties from their own side, the emptiness, the sambhogakaya of cognizance, and the nirmanakaya of uh, manifold capacity for compassion. Okay, so that's the outline of the whole talk. I hope you're interested in at least some parts of it and that you really will be bold with me and raise your hand if you have a question when I say something and I'll try to slow down and make it even simpler, okay? With me, okay, good. So now there are three parts <laughs> and I gave the main points of all three parts. Here are the main, parts, uh, the main points of the first part. The first part is ordinary physics. Western science looks for independent reality under uh, two sort of uh, principles. Um, one is materialism. The reality will be material only. Two is reductionism. In order to understand something big, like the water in the bottle, I should understand the molecules and the atoms that make up the water. And then if I see how tiny molecules act with each other, I can figure out why the water is wet, why is it liquid, why can it freeze. All of those questions come from looking at the tiny parts. That's a, that's a strategy called reductionism. Backing up and telling you something of the history, when the scientists started to invent physics, uh, this was in uh, Europe, so there was God, and God had written through the agency of various people, maybe speaking to some people, uh, a first book, the Bible. Bible comes in the Old Testament and the New Testament, right there. But the scientists who were then natural philosophers said there's a second book created by God, the book of nature. If we live in the world and everything and all the creatures were made, all the beings were made by God, analyzing that world is another way of finding out what the meaning is and what we should understand. Um, so the first principle was to look at nature, experimenting, observing closely, setting up conditions that otherwise wouldn't be there in order to find out what happens. The second principle developed over time was that what they found, they should articulate using math. So mathematics, wherever it is in your curriculum, is essential for understanding what the physics and science is. The result was material determinism. It worked very, very well for a couple of hundred years to keep finding more and more how Causes and conditions make things happen, starting from atoms and building up to all the ordinary material. Um, notice the point in the middle here. Only matter exists. No spirit, no consciousness. Uh, those were bracketed and people said, well, someday we'll be able to understand how the brain works as molecules and uh, neurons and so on, then we'll start to work on consciousness. So eventually, and this is even before the, so the, I forgot to say, or maybe I said it, but I want to emphasize, the atoms, which are the fundamental basic tiniest particles of ordinary matter, um, uh, make up everything. Everything is made out of atoms. I think I did say that, right? But there aren't five, and so each kind of atom is its own element. But instead of five elements, there are 92. 180. 
uh, 126. <laughs> there were 92 naturally occurring. And when we understood the atom well enough, we knew how to make other ones that lived for such a short time that they didn't occur in nature. They may have been made at the start of the Earth, but over billions of years, they disappeared. So, uh, thank you, yes. <laughs> 118 or 126, it depends on who you talk to. Uh, all the effects can only be understood if we learn very well about the atoms. Forces are the causes. The forces act on mass, which is undifferentiated matter, right? Uh, and there are conditions that say what those forces do. And the conditions are basically position and velocity. So it turns out what those guys in the 1700s and 1800s discovered was not the kind of physics that you see every day. Uh, here we live in gravity, and if I take anything, I better make sure I don't break it, it falls. And you might think, well, there's an earth element in the pointer and there's a huge amount of earth element in the earth, and earth element likes to be where there's a massive earth, so it goes towards it. Instead, the physicists say there's a force, and the force makes it go. So what they had discovered, they also, you know, if you throw something, it stops by itself. But it isn't really stopping by itself, it stops by friction. So they figured out that the real physics, the basic physics, the easier physics, is the kind of physics that now we can see in outer space. You want to see a video? OK. I thought you might at this point. This is uh, something that um, I think the British Space Agency uh, puts up. Newton won. I don't want to really give a complete physics lesson, mm -hmm. although, of course, I could. Uh, but th it, it's uh, very good at this point in the lecture. I hope the volume is, is high enough. We'll see in a second. They plug me in. Um, go. Here we are. Go. Hi, Pedro. That's a nice smile you've got there, Pedro. Not much is happening. The ball is just hanging there in midair. Pedro blows on it, and it moves because of the force of his breath. Now the ball is moving again, except this time Alexander has stopped it with his hand. And this time, <laughs> nice move. Pedro changes the ball's direction by applying a force. What you've been seeing are illustrations of Newton's first law of motion. This states that every object in motion or at rest remains in that state unless an unbalanced force is applied to it. The state of motion is the speed and also the direction. The two combined, speed and direction, are what we call velocity. An object at rest has a velocity of zero and it stays at rest unless acted on by a force. We call this tendency inertia. Here you can see Pedro applying a force to the ball. He is changing the ball's direction, therefore changing its velocity. In the second experiment, you see Alexander stopping the ball. Here he's changing the speed, therefore he's changing its velocity. The rate of change of velocity is called acceleration. I stopped there because we got to a mathematical symbol, and I remember how many people had their hands up. So you should tell that this is in the space. Without yes, I, I must emphasize, this is the real physics in a sense. It's in space, where because the orbiting space station is really falling, no gravity. Everything is falling at the same rate, and it, everything floats there. Then you apply a force, it changes the velocity, but the velocity stays the same. It just drifts forever until he blows up on it and it goes again in a different direction. I'm, my, my hands are reversed. It goes, he blows on it, it goes this way, then he blows on it, it goes that way. Or the other guy puts his hand up 
and he stops it. So the only time it changes how it's moving isn't by natural uh, resistance. There is none. It's only when the force applies. So what the physicist managed to do was to separate causes and conditions and to analyze each one. Let me go back to the talk. Uh, OK, the answer was yes, we want to see the video. Only matter exists. <laughs> this sort of emphasizes what I've been saying. No spirit. The causes are forces. They act on mass. The conditions are which are the particles. In this case, he had a little smiley ball that was a particle. Where are they located? It was floating there, and then he blew on it. The position is where is it, the velocity. Those are what we call initial conditions. And then math predicts everything given, notice my check mark, both causes, the first C, and the second, the conditions. And also, sorry, not five, but 92 elements. Okay. So what we were looking for all these years until the quantum mechanics came along was an objective reality, reduced to its tiniest parts, observer independent. Even before the start of the quantum era, we knew that they were atoms, but there was no satisfactory explanation for how the atoms actually worked. And that turns out to be quantum mechanics. So physics thinks itself the empirical theory of how everything works. And I emphasize, this is actually from my first lecture in physics classes, I emphasize thing. I guess I was saying this stuff before I knew any Buddhism. Mm -hmm. It's very good. Um, so let me now talk a little bit more about, this is the transition to the quantum mechanics. <clears throat> Some properties, I was uh, looking for a ball, but I didn't find one. Some properties that uh, ordinary objects have uh, can come in any amount. So imagine I have a ball here, OK? Can you picture, a, I don't know, a soccer ball or a cricket ball? There you go, a tiny cricket ball. If I flip it, it starts to spin, right? I can hold it, let go. If I was in outer space, it would just float there. No spin. I can turn it a little bit. It'll keep spinning like this, spinning around a given axis. Or I can give it more, or much more. Any amount is allowed. But that's only true of large objects. <clears throat> Some things that have any amount of value for a large object only come in small, discrete amounts when the object is tiny. And spin is one of them, and spin may be important for me to explain, uh, I mean, to use as an example. There are others. Um, uh, electricity comes as charge. Do you know electricity? How much electricity? So more or less electricity. We thought that electricity was like a fluid. You could get any amount, but it comes in individual bunches. There are others. The principle of tiny amounts being definite bundles is the quantum principle, and it leads to discreteness, meaning there are only certain allowed values. OK? With me? OK. So quantum means bundle. So you can have a bundle of spin. And physics always uses ordinary words. Work does not mean gainful employment for which you get rupees. Power isn't like political uh, capability. Force doesn't mean coercion. And I don't know what mass means in ordinary language. But we use those words in our own special meaning. The quantum, which is a bundle, is really of one particular one of these things that physicists use ordinary word for. It's a bundle of action. So that's what the quantum is. Planck's constant is a discrete amount of what physicists called action. Um, 
That's what has the smallest bundle, also charge. So now I'm into the body of my quantum mechanics talk. I used to have a lot of hair. Uh, that's why this cartoon is really me. <laughs> OK, you, can, you have a good imagination. You can see that that's me. The famous Heisenberg uncertainty principle really should be called indeterminacy. Because it isn't our knowledge that's missing. It's the determinate, definite value. Two things that are complementary in Heisenberg's terminology can't possibly be known at once, no matter what you do. This is a very important element of the story. So let's from now on call it Heisenberg indeterminacy. Uh, I don't know if you can tell and, or whether culturally these things come across. This is my left hand over here. My right hand is not just poorly drawn, but it's actually inside a boxing glove, with kind of mitten, which is padded and very heavy. And the little thing in the middle, whoops, <laughs> I didn't know that did that, just a minute. <laughs> the little thing in, oh, I'm giving away the secret. The little thing in the middle is a, a tiny symbol in yellow for an electron. I happen to use yellow for things that have electric charge, and the electron is the fundamental charge. Uh, there'll be a picture in a minute, so you'll see what all the details are. In my right hand, I have an orange arrow, but it's a big ham-handed fat, uh, what I say, boxing glove that's holding on to the magnetic field. I am very big. The electron is very small. In fact, atoms, uh, I think it came out to 10 locks of atoms across the width of my thumb, between 1 and 10, something like that. So they're so tiny. The electron is even smaller. Um, So this is Heisenberg's idea, basic idea. You can't know two things, like exactly the things we need to know from the video, the position of the ball and its velocity. Those two things, actually momentum, but velocity, the position and the velocity can't both be known at the same time. Heisenberg analyzed one particle, and he said, we're so big, the action quantum, remember, of action, is not dividable. So when we, with our big hands, hit something with a full quantum of action, it responds if we arrange it one way to tell us what the position is, but that knocks it around. And if we arrange it another way, we see exactly how fast it's moving, but then it could be anywhere in space. So it's According to Heisenberg's first paper, it's our ham-handedness and the smallness of the quantum. This is the international symbol for no, wrong. <laughs> Einstein got into the debate about quantum mechanics and shows that it's wrong, and my next uh, section will tell you why. It's wrong that it's because we are so big and these things are so small and the, ad, the quantum is so indivisible that there's uncertainty. It comes because fundamentally those two things can never be known. They don't, they're indeterminate. And here is what I promised. There's a picture of electron, I think big enough for you to see. It's a little yellow ball, right? Can you see it? A yellow sphere. Over here. Sorry. <laughs> it has a solid arrow in the middle. The solid arrow is a funny way of showing the spin. If you think about it, every particle in the spinning object is going around and around with different speed, different direction. But they're all going around one axis. And if you curl your fingers of the right hand in the direction, then you have an arrow. The more spin it has, the bigger the arrow. The direction is the axis it's spinning on. So that's just a symbolic way of showing. And what do you think this dotted line is? 
You see that as a dotted line with an arrow? That's the velocity. It's a dotted line because in the next little while it's going to go in that direction. So that's what we're trying to determine. Where is it and how fast is it going? And you can't. It seemed to come, this summarizes what I've just told you, it seemed to come from our heavy-handedness and indivisibility of the atom of action. Um, even a single quantum is so big amount compared to the, um, um, the, uh, uh, the spin of the electron that the only thing we can know about is the direction of the magnetic field that we picked. Wrong way, Herb. But Einstein didn't like that kind of theory. Einstein was a very moral guy in a certain sense. And he wanted physics to be about an external reality. So he thought very hard how to argue against the quantum theory and in favor of real live particles with real live paths. It turns out he ends up that uh, first, he contradicts Heisenberg, and then my three famous colleagues, Greenberger, Horn, and Zeilinger, contradict Einstein. So that's the story. The next part of the story is a tale of two contradictions. Um, his idea was to measure the properties of a particle. This is Einstein now, thinking about Heisenberg and the ham hands. And he says, I can think of a situation where I tell what the properties are of a particle, but I never touch the particle at all. So it doesn't matter how big my hands are, and it doesn't matter how disturbing a full quantum of action is. Here's his uh, intellectual trick. Nice picture. Einstein defines an element of reality. Instead of trying to uh, define everything about reality, or even the reality of all the possible properties of a single particle, he defines one property as an element of reality if we can determine what its value is. It's this this, this co uh, connects a lot of the things I've been talking about. He identifies reality with matter, and he thinks of measurement as the criterion for whether something is real or not. If you can measure it 100%, get a value without in any way touching that particle, then in the good world where physics is about reality, it must be because that property is real. Um, so this is a famous quote. It's one of the papers that uh, has the most citations ever. And, um, was turned into an experiment. It's called EPR, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. I think I wrote the names down at the bottom. Yeah, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. And it was turned into an experiment that you could do by uh, my friend David Bohm, no longer with us. Um, so here's my paraphrase, just a little bit changed from the original quote. I, uh, the, the change is to make it fit to my whole talk here and to also the questions that we all have about self-existing reality from its own side. If the property car, uh, can be determined without touching the particle in any way, then that property corresponds to an element of physical reality. It is real self-existing property even if we never measure it. Einstein says, this is the only appropriate goal for physics. Physics must be about reality. We can determine reality any way we want. If it doesn't disturb something, that must be it was real in the first place. Um, I, don't, I have a lot more time than I usually do, but uh, give me a warning when I'm halfway over. Okay, so remember I spoke about the spin and you could have something that was not spinning at all or you could have something that was spinning? You do remember that spin? Okay. So Einstein came up with the trick with David Bohm's help that if you start with something no spin at all, 
that splits into two things, one going to that side where Alice is and the other going to the other side where Bob is, it must be that the, since spin is conserved, always the same, that if it started with zero, we may not know where the spin is pointing, but if this one's pointing that way, the other one's opposite. If this one is up, this one's down. If it's pointing to the east, the other one points west. If it's pointing to the north, the other one points south. I probably have the directions wrong, but you get the idea, right? They start from zero, they have to point opposite each other. So I've indicated not knowing which way they are with the question mark, and to show that it's opposite, this was from a talk in Mexico, I had an upside down question mark. You don't know where it's pointing, but the other one is upside down. After the measurement here, the way you measure is you put in one of those ham-handed magnetic fields, just like I had in my boxing glove. If the particle that goes over to Bob on the right-hand side of the screen is deflected, it's going south. It's spinning to the south. Because we have the north magnetic field, it's pushed down, it has to be spinning opposite to the field, so that makes it south. But of course, that particle got batted around, so we don't know that it's real. We know that after the measurement it's real, but Einstein's criterion says we never touched this particle, and since it's already known to be before the measurement opposite, it must be north, but notice there's no interaction. So he says, this proves that the north already was there. There's a real property of the particle we didn't touch. You get it? 100% of the time you can tell whether it's north or south. Must have had a north spin in the first place. That contradicts not the, not the conclusion of Heisenberg, but the reasoning. He said, you knock things around. That's why you can't determine both position and momentum. Einstein says that's not why. The reason that uh, there's no position and momentum, he thought, is that the quantum mechanics is not the right theory. It's not complete. The two real properties could be determined by taking a partner and measuring them. Okay, so it turns out so that's the first contradiction. Remember I said there are two contradictions. First contradiction is Heisenberg's reason is wrong. Einstein shows that something's going on, which isn't because we're so big and the particles are so small. Um, it turns out there's a more modern, better way to look at these properties of reality. And it's a simple move, which I guess people could have done in the 1930s, of going from, remember Heisenberg one particle, Einstein two particles, go to three particles. It turns out that if we have three particles coming out of the source, and we make two different measurements of the spin, we get results that contradict that they're all real. Each of the particles has a real north spin and a real uh, east spin, um, but it's not determined beforehand, and the pattern of uh, results is contradictory. At the end, if you have a question and you're willing to go into the technical stuff, I'll show you how to use coins from your pocket to demonstrate what the contradiction is. It's a direct contradiction, and it happens 100% of the time. What the pattern of reality shows when you make a different measurement of all three of the same kind of spin is contradicted by what the experiment gets. So the key proof, a little bit like some middle way philosophy when arguing against the correct kind of philosopher, is by contradiction. Um, the realistic assumption fails every time with the GHZ state. So let me summarize. One particle, we thought it might be the 
our action is the problem with indeterminacy, kind of a nine reality. Two particles, Einstein argues there should be a reality underneath it. Three particles shows Einstein's definition is wrong. You don't need any statistics. You don't have to uh, infer anything from the, uh, the theory except Einstein's own definition and the experimental results. <laughs> so here's my international sample for wrong again. <laughs> the real self-existent property, even if we don't measure it, eh, wrong. That's contradiction number two. So my main points again. Do you like it that I come back again and again? Maybe you have a chance. <laughs> give, give everybody a chance. Uh, Western science looked for reality under materialism, no spirit, and reductionism, down to atoms and particles. Atoms and particles required an extension of the ordinary physics theory into quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics disproves the elements of the very reality that Einstein and all the physicists who started quantum mechanics were after. So I give myself, whoop, ah, I should never use that. <laughs> I don't know how to work this thing. Uh, page up. Page down. Page up. Here. So I give myself two checks, good marks, for that point and for the second point. The reality is disproven. And now a red point, because it's really connecting to the right answer, the properties of the particles arise when we seek to measure them, right? The micro reality is being created by the observer, not independent. They, the, the properties arise codependently. The reality is empty. It's a nice uh, punchline for Galukpa audience. <laughs> now, how many people read English really carefully? If you do, you may notice I spelled reality wrong. There's an extra T. Good. The extra T is in italic. It's slanty. Yeah. yeah. In mathematics and physics, a slanty T means time always means time. This is from uh, my book, Muddling Through. If you look at the word reality with an extra notion of time inserted into it, so it's reality, you can rearrange the letters and it means otherness because it can spell the word alterity. Not quite an English word, but parallel to a French word where other people have made the same word play. Uh, what we did in my institute is analyze how reality is being shaped by science in two different ways. One is the microscopic way where you make the measurement in an experiment on a microscopic or even a macroscopic and you make what you are measuring to be real. And you make it to have a definite value which is the sign of measurement and math that we took all throughout the history of science to be earmarks of real. At the same time, you cannot control what the outcome is. There's always some part from nature that is very other than yourself. So we have the word alterity for otherness. So reality is made in time by oh, Western science reality, okay. Made in time by the investigation but it's still other than us. It's very strange. Um, now I uh, hesitate to even speak in an audience like this, but in my own Dzogchen meditation, eventually with enough practice, pointing out instructions, pith instructions, finally the intervention of a realized master, you recognize the natural state of the nature of mind, the Dharmakaya. When you do, in my experience, it kind of illuminates a lot of text and discussion and debate. I'm not much of a scholar or a investigator, but the message is very clear. That emptiness, 
which resonates so well with the created nature of the properties of particles that West was depending on for reality, that emptiness is very, very aware, awake, cognizant, knowing, and at the same time, 100% compassionate. If you ask me a question, I can tell you what happened to me on first recognition, and you'll see why I know this is true, just completely true. But that's a personal uh, uh, sort of side issue. You understand better than I what I mean when I say these things. Okay, it points that way for me. Starting from self-existence, physics found conditional reality, and in the whole world of the intellectual West, that same indeterminacy principle that Heisenberg introduced spread to many, many fields. I don't know what's going to happen in the 21st century, but in the 20th century, limits to knowledge became something that each field had to investigate. And in fact, the most important one, the most famous one, is Gödel's proof in mathematics. That's why it's listed first over here. I wish I could point with my finger, but I have to use this gadget. Mathematics, where Gödel showed that any system strong enough of mathematics to define even the integers, just the whole numbers, would always have things about it that could never be proven in the system that defined the numbers. It's a very interesting proof. It turns out that Gödel was at the Institute for Advanced Study when I was there, he was getting very old, and that he attributed his own proof of the limits of mathematics to interactions with the quantum physicists. He talked to them, he had some ideas, there were famous problems set by a different mathematician, and he solved one of them by showing you couldn't complete the system of numbers, let alone fractions, irrational numbers or any fancier systems. So the same thing has happened in sociology. You all know in sociology, if you add an observer to try to find out what's happening in a system of people, it changes the system. So the observer interaction is, is very common and mentioned in many fields of, whoa, sorry. No, it's not working. <clears throat> Okay, so there's a certain limit and it, it goes to the rest of the knowledge system in the West. Uh, now I wanna shift gears to the third part of my talk, the question about the morality and what to do about it. So if anyone wants to ask me anything about the ordinary physics or the quantum physics, you can raise your hand now or you, I see some people taking notes. Write down your question if you wanna follow some convention and ask me only at the end. Uh, are there any questions so far about physics or quantum physics? Okay, I'm sure you have some. I'd be glad to answer at the end. Okay. This circumstance of uncertainty being really indeterminacy, of properties not existing on their own side, of parallel situations for welfare economics, for, socio, uh, for sociology, for mathematics, for uh, economics, for um, many, many fields, made me wonder, back to the question, it works. Who does it work for, right? What is the morality of all of this Western knowledge? Is this self-recognition the end to the idea that science could be value free, that knowledge was powerful, but it was up to others. We hope the wise politicians will use the power of our knowledge that we generate for good purposes. But we refrain from making value, we refrain from asking who does our science work for? Let the technology develop, let the science be applied. But I say, if we're creating what we study, uh, then just saying science is value free, knowledge is powerful but can go in any direction, is not 
responsible. It's not sufficient. If we create the phenomena that we study, the things we choose to make real, what should we study, what questions should we ask, what should we make real for the benefit, <laughs> to put it in good terms, for the benefit of the most beings in the most worlds, in the most universes. And so part of that, I founded an institute called the Institute for Science and Interdisciplinary Studies. I'll skip the story at the bottom of this slide about the willies, which is a kind of moral uh, shakiness. Um, but I'll go to the idea behind the institute. Our theoretical idea was that we could study things in biology, in sociology, social science, natural science, physics, and study them in a new combination with people who understood history, philosophy, and sociology of science. So a second kind of expert besides the experts inside the field. And with what we call on the slide JPFs, JPF stands for just plain folks. You introduce the people in your institute who do other kinds of work, the students in your classes who aren't really specializing in the field, the people from the community who eventually will have to suffer whatever side effects you produce and you pick projects of all different types and put these three rings of kinds of people together to shape always asking who does it work for, what are the morals it built in, what are the values you're serving, who is it possible for it to uh, be used by. So we had many projects. Military waste is uh, summarized here. Sequoia survival with some uh, 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 what do you call them, indigenous people in the uh, Amazon David Bohm style dialogue, many seminars, and my best example, hello, <laughs> my own specialty, quantum teleportation, which I will talk about if I still have a few more minutes. Okay, good. So what is quantum teleportation? Nice name, right? Quantum teleportation sounds very tricky and beam me up, Scott. How many people have seen Star Trek, Star Wars, pictures of outer space. Nobody. There are, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you in the back, raising your hands. Uh, so uh, now I give a little lesson on uh, Star Trek, small lesson. We say the word teleportation, you immediately think about Scotty. Beam me up, Scotty. But that device is so common in the 24th century that it's called the transporter, not the teleporter. And the people who invented the word teleportation were actually embarrassed to discover that it came from spiritualism, where it was a name for a kind of uh, psychokinesis or something. And it wasn't, but it doesn't matter. You all know when you say teleportation, you think I'm going to, uh, well, let's, that's, I need that. Uh, we're going to send this bottle from here, put it in some kind of scientific apparatus, and then get really pure, clean water in New York City, which needs it. Right? Can't happen. First of all, it does not send objects. Second of all, in the movies, you'll notice that Spock starts to disappear immediately and starts to appear immediately on a planet that's thousands of miles away. That can't happen either because that would be faster than the speed of light, right? Yeah. This requires going slower than the speed of light. It requires sending not objects, but the particular kind of information that tells you what the quantum state is. I haven't emphasized the quantum state, but I'm trying to talk very generally. And it also, and you can't aim it at a point like, uh, uh, Scotty sets coordinates and then it beams down there. It goes to wherever the partner is. Remember I spoke about Alice and Bob, A and B? 
the two kinds of particles that are all pointing opposite each other are called entangled with each other. And you must have Alice, was this side Alice? Yeah. Alice's particles already entangled with Bob's and ready to go to receive the information. So now the, the uh, unfortunate punchline. Quantum teleportation is a jazzy, made up, fancy kind of sales pitch name for remote state exchange. If I had called it that, nobody would be interested. So let's keep calling it um, quantum teleportation. What's interesting about quantum teleportation is as I told you, the experimenter makes something real by choosing to measure it. Remember that? If you measure spin in one direction, you wipe out the information in another direction. This was the first experiment, which actually I had said would happen sometime uh, many years earlier. I think the experiment was done in 1994 or six, the theory in 1993 or 94. And I had written in 1987 that someday people would do something amazing with the choice that an experimenter makes. You can't make the particles go in a certain way. They squirt around and do what they're going to do. But you can choose to make something real. And I thought at that time, once that happens, my colleagues and I will have to really think about this powerful uh, aspect of our work. We make something real, and it transfers the quantum information like that. Unfortunately, even before quantum teleportation, Alice and Bob had entered the literature of quantum mechanics from cryptography. So it turns out they're spies. This is uh, one of my most brilliant uh, Indian students, Usha, who drew Alice as the spy in the fedora hat, and Bob, the, I, I don't know if Mad Magazine has uh, uh, penetrated very much here. But anyway, there's a famous spy versus spy comic strip. These are the spies. Uh, now, this is a bad diagram for the current audience. My wife is sitting here, and she told me it should be color-coded, because then you could at least look at the colors. But let me go through it, if, if I, I may. Here at the bottom, with a bunch of mathematical symbols, S equals 0 means a spin 0 source. Here on the dotted lines are the particles which we don't give wavy lines to, because they don't have a state yet. All they have is their relationship of oppositeness. I like to be technically correct, and the mirror is there because otherwise Bob's particle arrives too quickly because he has to wait until Alice does something and she has to send a message. Now, let me explain it completely for experts and those who like to have pictures. There are four possible outcomes. That's what the four circles on the end of Alice's box. I'll tell you in a minute what she does, what she makes to be real. But let me tell you just part of it, OK? The green light here happens when what she makes real is not just that her particle and Bob's are entangled, like this, but she makes real her particle being entangled with the unknown particle that's coming in. These symbols mean it has a state, that's the psi, and it has a direction that it's pointing. I told you that you spin in any direction. The two Greek letters there, theta and phi, are the lati uh, co-latitude, really, the latitude and longitude of the direction. So if you can picture a globe and you know where you're located, that is a direction from the center of the Earth. That's the direction that the particle is spinning. Let me back up and go slower. The green light means Alice has determined that this particle with a definite state coming from the left-hand side of the screen is opposite to hers that she received from the source. 
So get ready. One quarter of the time, no matter what part, of, not, no, matter, no matter what direction the incoming particle is spinning, one quarter of the time, Alice discovers it's opposite her own. But if it's is she on, she's on this side, yeah. If it's opposite her own, and she already knows hers is opposite Bob, then opposites of opposites are parallel. When the light goes green, the message she sends to Bob is don't do anything. You already have the chosen state. One quarter of the time, he already has it. But he doesn't know which quarter of the time until she tells him. Is that clear? That's what this diagram shows. Here's the opposite particles on dotted lines. Here's a definite particle. I should have had it really pointing in some direction so you could see what it was talking about. Alice determines with the green light that hers is opposite to the known, uh, the, un we call, the original paper called the unknown state. So she sends a message. I use two lines because there are four outcomes. Zero, one, two, three. But they could be coded the way information is in your ordinary computer. Zero, 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 one, that's one. One, zero, which is a binary for two, and one, one. So there are two bits of information. Here's this thing that points anywhere in the world, any different direction, doubly infinite to use the mathematical term. And with just two bits of information from Alice to Bob, he gets the same exact state. I don't expect you all to, uh, there won't be a quiz at the end, and I don't expect you all to understand everything here. Uh, just let me point out, this is the state that has those two funny Greek letters telling you where it's pointing. And here's the state that comes out at Bob's end after he does what he has to do. Same state, that's the point. So what's been transferred, really, is the quantum information that tells you which of the directions it's pointing. But the diagram is a little bit funny in its perspective. The S is kind of stretched. The circle's not round. That's because there is no such thing. Oh, so here, this explains. What we choose, we place the equipment there. Alice's equipment is actually to see how entangled is she with this particle that she's never met before. That's the question she chooses, and the it that we make real is entanglement. But then the particles choose which of the four lights. This I already told you, that somewhere we hoped that a moral implication would come true. But history never fails to surprise. The first surprise was that instead of Alice and Bob, I mean, instead of A and B, it had already been made into this pseudo-anti-sexist Alice and Bob. Um, the second was that Alice and Bob were spies. And the third was that our literary analysis, I'm coming to the punchline, just hold on for a little while longer, uh-oh. Plug it in. This is gonna be great, it's gonna end just when I end. It turns out that in order to make a state, you have to have an additional character, Charles, the chooser. There is no such thing as an unknown state because it really represents what we did to create it in the first place. So Charles picks these two knobs, theta and phi, and he sets his magnetic apparatus so that all the particles that go through are pointing in that direction. So in addition to Alice and Barb, there has to be Charlie, the chooser whom I call Charles in reference to Prince Charles, because if you do manage to send a quantum state, well, you'll want to do something with it. So Bob, who both Alice and Bob have no idea what the state is. Bob has to send it to someone who's a de detector or a disposer or a deployer or a doer, namely Diana. So Charles and Di are really the people who are doing the work and making Alice and Bob serve them. Notice the political implication, right? <laughs> but there's also a physics implication. Once I had realized with the help of those people who study science in the second circle of our three ring uh, 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 a group working on quantum teleportation at my institute, 
Ah. Uh. Hmm. Power supply? I can, I can just tell you. Okay. It turns out that if we move Charles from chooser outside of Alice and Bob into the diagram where he gets his hands on Alice's particle first, then uh, he can affect what the state is of the particle that's already going to Alice. And they invented a new kind of quantum teleportation. Maybe it's better to just tell this story. It's called super dense teleportation, which sends twice as much quantum information using the same amount of classical information. It's not coming back yet. Um, and NASA is funding the development of this new idea, super dense teleportation, for communication from outer space. So it's not just a story about morality. It's not just a story about reality. It also is a way to do some very interesting things inside of science. It doesn't help clear out the fact that we're working for the state. In fact, the funder is the NASA uh, National Aeronautic and Space Administration of the US. So it raises its own questions. Anyway, thank you very much. So now you can. Yeah. Now it is time for question and answer. So if anybody has question, you may ask. If you have any questions or if you need any clarification on any point of the presentation, please feel free. So, um, we have been uh, looking at the uh, reductionistic uh, approach of, uh, you know, the um, quantum physics. I quite often find that, um, um, yes, it is uh, from the classical point of view, uh, the quantum physics, uh, physics in general and particularly uh, qu quantum physics is a very, very reductionist. That's right. Yeah, but um, when we see from the Madhimika's point of view and from Dzogchen's point of view, then do we really go to that extent of reducing uh, the, all of these, you know, the quantum particles and quantum energies and quantum actions uh, to, you know, to, 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 to the level of uh, what we call, you know, in, in, in Madhimika, uh, emptiness, to the level of emptiness, because uh, in quantum physics, uh, uh, still it goes to that level of quantums and uh, quarks, but uh, still it gets stuck over there and then doesn't yeah. go beyond that, yeah. right? So therefore, in certain ways, it is a reductionist, but uh, not in the ultimate sense of reductionistic approach, whereas uh, Many, you know, um, again, the, the term reductionism has a two connotations, yes. right? Uh, in Western philosophy and in Western world, reductionism has a some ki sometimes a negative kind of uh, connotation because uh, if everything is reduced to, to nothing, then just as, uh, you know, Madhimika is uh, uh, charged of being nihilistic, so it, it also has... Uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, understanding from the uh, other schools that uh, Madhimika is uh, nihilistic, right? Whereas uh, from other schools, non-Buddhist, uh, the Buddhism itself is uh, selfless. So it is, an, again, a reductionist and nihilistic, right? So to what extent we can, uh, when we look at these philosophical stands, then we have uh, uh, many levels of redu reductionism. Of course, when we see um, science from that point of reductionism, uh, it reduces to the quarks and to that uh, very, you know, very small level of, uh, uh, you know, uh, entities. But still, it gets stuck at the quarks level. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I would say that you're right. Everything that this approach does goes to small things under high vacuum, great energies, big machines, 
and yet there's something there. But the properties of what's there are empty. So if you were happen to be a scientist who's thinking about morality of what you're doing at the same time, you would start to investigate systems of emptiness. Now, from my little understanding of Majamaka, um, it actually participates of the middle way, which counters both nihilism and essentialism. And if I understand where you're coming from, there's an element of essentialism in what's left in modern physics. Because although they have funny properties or no properties, or you make them and the ego is created at the same time as the object of ego, nevertheless, we're looking at small things, they're things. So uh, there's a certain essentialism to the modern physics, no matter how often or how moral or open or warm a scientist is, they're stuck on the essentialist and they're willing to accuse Buddhists all of nihilism. But the theory within Buddhism is very clear that the middle between nihilism and essentialism contradicts both of them and is not really stained. So I'm wondering you know, I'm really working on this, as you, as you know, from private conversation. I'm wondering if it's possible to remove the stain of essentialism from modern physics by introducing the moral question. What are we doing? Who do we serve? Why is it always the rich people that benefit and the poor people who suffer whatever we produce? If you ask that question, then maybe you take back from the essentialism of it's all quarks and it's all this and that, they just have funny properties, a lesson about thinking more broadly, what are you doing? So I'm here searching, you know, I'm not just not uh, teaching or trying to tell you things and then maybe elicit a question or two. I'm here to learn. So that's my hope. I think you're right. It, but it's, it's parallel. We scientists, being scientists, accuse nihilism, no selfism, mystic consciousness, what the heck are you guys talking about? But, but now you're accusing me of essentialism, which is sort of the other side. And maybe there's a middle way for science, too. That's my hope. Um, science, uh, you know, in many ways um, has a very um, neutral kind of, you know, stand, which I like very much because uh, um, unless they find it, find something to be non-existent, they don't negate that, right? right. And they don't make the statement that it does not uh, exist. They're open in that They're regard. They're open in that, which is, uh, you know, certainly uh, very liberal and also very you know, uh, realistic in, in that sense. And uh, science has been approaching every, every now and then and going deeper into the realities. And do you think that, uh, my question is, uh, after quarks and all these, you know, uh, you, leb lebex or leblex, the, the, the Latin smallest, lebex or lebex or what? The smallest particles. Leptons? Lepton, yeah, yeah. lepton, yeah. And even if Quarks you and leptons, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a lepton. Lepton, uh, Cox is a lepton. So if, even if you go to that level, uh, you get stuck there, right? And so therefore my observation, or my um, assumption is that um, uh, certainly the science will move forward. Uh, yeah, yeah, move forward down the line uh, because uh, what we see from the Mademika point of view there's not even a sub, at the subatomic level, there's nothing that can stand by its own, right. but can be reduced to emptiness, right? Right. So what is your kind of uh, you know, yeah. assumption that uh, will it okay. go forward? Okay. It's very, very difficult to predict what science will find. 
all of the things that I spoke about, one contradiction, another contradiction, Einstein's intervention, they're really not what you would say. I was very happy when there was only one kind of neutrino and it had zero mass. Now there are three kinds and none of them have zero mass. Very sad for me. But Einstein would be very happy if the eventual theory becomes uh, a combination of quantum mechanics and gravity and replaces all of these particles with some structure of geometry. So the problem is to change the mind of the scientist into encompassing uh, compassion, let's just summarize all the good values with compassion, into everything of their work. So your philosophy advances, maybe slowly nowadays, although I understand there are some brilliant people who make commentaries on commentaries on commentaries, like translating Tsong Kappa's work on the Mula Majamika Karika, whatever it is. <laughs> so there's modern work being done in Buddhism, and there's modern work being done in uh, physics. And I think in neither case you can pre completely predict What's remarkable to me is that if you practice enough, there's no doubt about uh, maybe an old-fashioned way of talking, maybe being modernized, about the truth of Buddhism and its combination of knowing and caring. That's something that's missing from science. So if we get past the essentialism of the quarks and the other particles, and particles are replaced, by twists and knots, and one of my students is working on loops. That won't, it'll be a new essentialism unless somewhere along the way, the deeper, oh, that, now you come to the second part of my title, the deeper ultimate reality somehow affects the, con the, the conduct of science. If science doesn't come to its own Western version of us seeking uh, the truth in an ultimate sense, it's lost. It'll be one form of essentialism or another, or it may even become some form of nihilism, but it will not find the middle way unless it takes its own version of the lessons that one comes to in meditative practice combined with study in your field. Question? The monk in the back. Question? There's one there. One where? Please Middle. raise your hand. Yeah. Hello, sir. Namaste. It was quite complicated, uh, the physics uh, the class you have given. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my question is very simple. That uh, I always wonder that uh, what happens to the gravitational force in quantum world? Since uh, there is the time and the space is uh, reduced there, but uh, what happens to the gravitational force? And uh, the, the gravitational force is, uh, is uh, uh, varied in, in, the, in the Earth and the outer world as well. So how do you uh, relate those things? Good question. So the first thing to say about quantum mechanics and gravitation uh, is we don't know how they go together. It's the biggest modern problem that doesn't need additional exper um, you know, uh, observational information. We know enough about gravity. We've just discovered the f uh, proof that there are gravity waves recently but we don't know how to make it quantum mechanical. So that's part of the current research problem. The second thing to say is I'm very happy to announce that the field of neutron physics uh, was basically launched on an experiment that I proposed with the spin, too complicated to describe, and that my colleague who really is the source of the Greenberger Horn Zeilinger 
uh, this proof of reality. Greenberger came up with a fundamental experiment using neutrons that shows the quantum force affects the, I mean the gravity force, ordinary earth gravity affects the quantum state of a particle that's small like a neutron. So we know they do go together, but we don't know the complete theory of how to make gravity into a quantum mechanical theory. That's really the right answer, I think. Thank you for the question. Uh, let me ask you a very simple question, maybe for you. For me, it's a very difficult. Uh, my first question is, uh, actually, I have heard before about quantum teleportation. Uh, I think it's a, in, it was invented around the 1983, but I'm not sure. Uh, actually, this is there's no transport in the particle, just right. qubit, qubit. So right, qubit. Yeah, yes, qubit. Uh, yeah, profoundly, someone asked me uh, if someone else asked me, very profound level, how can we define the qubit? Okay. Very good. So this is my first question. Second, uh, uh, there's any, uh, do you think there's any relationship between qubit and the superposition? Yes. When we explain about superposition, can we a little bit more better to understand or, or, or explain the theory of qubit, based okay. on qubit? Okay. Is it, uh, I understand the question, okay. I think. First part is, what is a qubit? Second part of your question, how does whatever qubit is relate to superposition? Right, thank you. Okay. So, um, it's part of the talk that I left out. And a qubit is any system that's quantum mechanical and has only two outputs, two possible values. So I actually was using qubits as physics example throughout the quantum section of my talk. So the best example is the spin of any of the ordinary particles, electron, proton, neutron, and also the polarization of light. So the last one you all actually may know. I don't know if the fog ever goes away in the summer around here because I haven't been here. But I assume there's a time of the year when it's not raining and it's also not foggy, maybe only one day. We have lots, of days. lots of days, good. <clears throat> so you probably have sunglasses that are polarized. They're green plastic glasses and they say polarized on them. If you take one of them and your friends and you rotate, you will see the effect of a qubit. Now, of course, you, what you're seeing is a lock of a lock of a crore of qubits all coming through at once. But if only one particle was there, it would be a qubit. And so I can use that as the example. Is that OK? OK. In the sunglasses, see if I get it correctly, there are molecules that are stretched in this direction. They're green molecules, which is why the polarized sunglasses are always dark green, most of the time dark green. They're stretched in that direction, and they let their electrons vibrate up and down, but not side to side. All the glare light that reflects, you can even see some here on the floor, off of puddles or shiny metal is going into your eye polarized the other way. So the sun light is blocked more for glare than for anything else, completely blocked for glare. Okay, in your sunglasses, if you turn just a little bit, it'll pass through polarized photons that are at a different angle. 
And there were a million different angles between zero degrees and 180 degrees, which is the same as zero, right? Each of those is a different state of a qubit. And each of them is exactly cosine theta of up and down and sine theta of right and left. So every one of the individual states is a superposition of two states. So let me summarize. Qubit is any two-state system. Superposition occurs for any two-state system. If you know enough math, it's actually a simple combination of two different components. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? Any other question? Maybe. Okay. Thank you very much, Bobby, sir. Thank you again. Uh, now I would like to request uh, Vice Chancellor to offer scarf and souvenir to Professor, and also I would like to request to express uh, Vice Chancellor's view on the subject. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Vice Chancellor. Thank you, all of the teachers and students who have attended. Thank you, CUTS, the Central University for Tibetan Studies. Thank you, His Holiness, for supporting and having established this. And thank you, Sarnath, for a wonderful place that we've stayed. Uh, so we have heard a very wonderful lecture from, from Professor Herbert uh, Bernstein. Sometimes I spell Ernstein. So um, it is uh, really um, a good time to ponder into these areas uh, where reality is searched. As you can see that in the East, we have a very profound uh, you know, uh, philosophical tradition, which also um, kept on for millennia to, to in search of reality. And in India itself, there are many traditions, Buddhist and Vedic and non-Vedic traditions. And within Vedic uh, traditions, there are many sub-schools. Uh, and also within uh, non-Vedic Shramanir schools, there are also many schools. So all of these schools, for thousands of years, kept on searching reality. And that search of reality is not, not just uh, simply for the sake of knowledge, but uh, something related to one's life and uh, emancipation from the suffering. And that is the goal of the every search that uh, we in India had uh, uh, for the last uh, several thousands of years. So it is also very interesting to see that uh, in the West, uh, science evolved, and it is not very, very old, as old as uh, the uh, Asian and particularly the Indian traditions, but it explored, explored the, you know, the material world, and uh, surprisingly, with the, uh, such a profundity, it has gone to that level where we have heard from Professor, uh, again, I'm going to spell like uh, Einstein, Bernstein. So, uh, so this is very, I always find this as a, some very enriching uh, kind of phenomena in human uh, civilization, that at the one part of the world, the scientist searched the reality, and uh, that has gone down to that level of, you know, uh, subatomic level, 
where everything is reduced to that level, I think that itself is uh, commendable, plaudible, in many ways, because out of this uh, we came to know lots of many other things, right? Whatever is being now these days uh, in digital life, in what is being played on the screen, are all outcome of these studies. Of course, the, all of these scientist researchers have so far, I say, you know, emphatically so far, uh, confined to material world. And this material world has been the evolutions that the science has brought is certainly uh, greatly contributed to humanity. If you see in the medical you know, life, if you see in the transportation, in you, if you see in the communication, uh, most of, all of these are, we can say, the result of science. And now science is moving towards inner world. And it is again so, you know, nice to see the, con we shouldn't say the convergence as such, but meeting of the, you know, Eastern thought and uh, Western science itself is a great kind of uh, uh, boon for the human civilization. Now, at the moment, we have a problem with the science that uh, the term consciousness, we call it jnana or shepa in Namshi in Tibetan and Gyan in Sanskrit, Vigyan. In, in, in English, we have a consciousness, which is very vaguely used, but whenever we have a dialogue, we use the same term, consciousness, which we refer, you know, very, the point of reference is very different, right? The scientists, when they talk about, you know, when we are having dialogue with the scientist, then they talk about, you know, consciousness, referring to brain. And sometimes, even within the neuroscientist, they refer not to the brain itself. The neurons are not consciousness. But the activities and actions and the consciousness is a property of, you know, neurons, right? The brain, when it is in action. And whereas for us, when we say consciousness, consciousness is not, you know, the brain itself, not, neither the neurons nor the brain itself, nor even the activities and, activities and properties of uh, brain and neurons. But we mean something, an independent entity, which is somehow related to brain, but not, uh, you know, the brain itself or a property of brain. So we, when we have a dialogue, we have always a problem to which we are referring. So now it has uh, recently, when I was in Mungot, one of the very renowned scholar, uh, scientist, uh, Professor Christ, uh, Christoph, scientist Christoph, uh, brain scientist, he has even gone to the level that, uh, yes, we, I think brain alone may not be the basis or the, you know, the phenomena uh, which we, to which we can refer to as uh, you know, consciousness. Rather, it can be associated with the subtler kind of you know, a body or kind of phenomena, uh, physical, physical phenomena, which exactly what the Buddhism is talking about in Tantra. The subtle energy that we are talking about is always associated with the mind. It, it is as a wahana of the, you know, the vehicle of the consciousness, vehicle of the uh, jnana. When we are talking, uh, you know, having dialogue with the scientist, then we don't talk about the, you know, rebirth and uh, as His Holiness has very candidly mentioned that we sh should not be bringing uh, rebirth and enlightenment and things like that, God phenomena, things like that on table while we are having a dialogue uh, and conversation with the scientist. However, Buddhism believes that when a person dies and passes to the next life, then it passes with that subtle energy, which is the subtlest kind of physical form. So here, again, science, one of the, you know, one of the top scientists is, you know, now thinking about not absolutely coming out of that brain box, but also possibility of, you know, 
same possibility of, you know, finding a subtlest kind of uh, physical object which could be, you know, uh, associated with the mind, consciousness. So I think this itself is a kind of a breakthrough uh, with the discussions that we have been having. And these are some of the things that are developing very fast, uh, you know, in the science domain these days. And another thing that I find very interesting is uh, um, that in the Western world, in the scientific world, the scientists have found, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Bernstein um, you know, said that, uh, about 100, 118, 122 elements are there in the material world. And they found it, that every composite composed phenomena is composed of those things, right? We have to find out how many elements are there in this. But uh, so far as the inner world is concerned, Buddhism has found more than 100 mental elements, which is such a you know, fascinating kind of thing to juxtapose uh, with the science, you know, scientific finding and the Buddhist findings. Buddhist has been, Buddhism has been, you know, interested more in the inner world. Of course, it has also explored the external world, talked about impermanence of the external world, talked about uh, the, you know, emptiness of the, in, you know, the external world. It did not develop any kind of, you know, the digital, you know, kind of communication and things like that, of course, but uh, which are related to our perception. Why Buddhism has been very interested in uh, finding out the impermanence and the emptiness of uh, the entire phenomena, let it be material or you know, inner world, is because it is related to our perception. And the perception is related to our experience. And experience is how, how we react to the world and society. That is how Buddhism is interested in the you know, reality of the life. Not because it has to create the technology, right? But to make the person uh, you know, happier and to elevate from suffering. That is the main objective. So it is fascinating to find these two you know, systems coming to the point of finding the ultimate kind of you know, composite element of the external world on the one hand by the scientist and the mental element of uh, you know, more than 100 in the, in the Buddhist tradition. Because every kind of mind, when I pick up this, when I see this cup, cup at that moment, how many mental components are working together? How many mental elements are working together? When I have anger, how many mental elements are working together at that time? When I have a compassionate attitude at that very moment, how many mental you know, elements are at work? So these are some of the things that are you know, extremely important to find out the reality in our life and in the world, right? So these are some, something that you know, now fortunately, the science and Buddhism and science and, uh, you know, science and contemplative uh, traditions and particularly for the last many years, uh, with the initiatives of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, they have come, uh, you know, together in doing joint research and many things like that. And the science, uh, that is why I say that so far science has been, you know, interested in exploring the external world. Well, now, now for the last 15 years, 15, 20 years, the science has already started to explore the inner world and has, you know, uh, found groundbreaking uh, results in, as a result of their researches. So which I think is a, a great hope for uh, future humanity. And these are really now being introduced in education, introduced in clinical researches, introduced in, you know, and uh, the, the medical researches and uh, many other areas. So which uh, I think some, you know, down the line sometime, we will be able to find, you know, uh, that how happiness can be created uh, 
without depending on a particular kind of religious tradition or something like that. So that is not very far from now. And uh, if we are to understand the reality of the world, then the realities are, these are the realities. These are not, you know, hypothetical assumptions, but these are the realities. So I, I won't go into details. Uh, fortunately, today, uh, uh, Dr. Bernstein's uh, uh, lecture is in the morning and in the afternoon from two o'clock, uh, there is a, um, um, a symposium uh, on edu ethics and morality in education organized by uh, uh, classic, uh, classical and modern language department. And then I, I, I was just informed that uh, in the late evening, the students association is going to organize a talk by somebody, some writer who has written a book on uh, Tibetan life or something like that. I'm not quite sure about that. But uh, so it's going to be a kind of, you know, full day uh, um, exercise with uh, lots of uh, food for thought. So uh, I really appreciate uh, Professor Bernstein uh, for coming here, visiting us. Because Hampshire, with Hampshire, we have a relation for the last, you know, 25 years. We are going to celebrate the 25th years silver jubilee this year. And then uh, Professor uh, Bernstein has been there for the last 20, 19, 20 years. 27. No, no, uh, in Hampshire. Uh, 45. 45 years? Oh, I see. OK, so it sounds that. Uh, mm. And um, so it is certainly, um, you know, very, uh, we are very happy to um, you know, have, uh, have him here. We met at a conference in Delhi organized by Indian Council for Cultural Relation, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, invited scholars uh, and uh, scientists uh, from many different countries uh, uh, on the topic of uh, quantum, reality. quantum reality and shunya, shunya and the theory of Shunya. So we met there, and prior to that, uh, we, I received uh, an email from uh, Professor Bernstein uh, willing, you know, expressing his willingness to you come here. So right away, I you know, wrote him back saying that you're most welcome. So thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Mary, uh, your wife, uh, for coming here and uh, sharing and being with us for some time. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you very much.